Hi, uh, welcome uh, everyone who's starting to join. Um, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes, but you'll see uh, some demographic questions popping up in the poll. And you, if you want to take the time, we'd be much appreciated if you could answer those. And you just have to scroll down to see. I think there's a total of three. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started in about a few seconds. I just wanted to remind uh, anyone who's just joining, if you could please answer the demographic questions in the poll and just scroll down. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. I think uh, we will get started then. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, and I know you're you're all slowly coming in here, but we are uh, on part three of a six part series of substance use disorder and HIV. Uh, this one is uh, regarding initiating buprenorphine in the fentanyl era and other treatment considerations in patients with opioid use disorder and HIV. Very exciting. Um, I am the moderator today. Uh, my name is Sandy Springer. I'm an uh, infectious disease and addiction medicine physician and a professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine in the section of infectious disease. And our presenter today is Dr. Leah Leish. She is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the Department of Internal Medicine. And we will uh, uh, start her talk in a few minutes. Just wanted to remind you here that uh, this is a part of the series uh, regarding the DEA training requirement that now, as you are all aware, probably uh, now know that all DEA certificate holders must complete an education comprising of at least eight hours of training um, specific to the management of substance use disorders. So we have as part of this series here, this uh, IAS USA DEA CME Resource Center that is on the website. Here's a picture here. And just to note, this is the third part of a, a six part series and two of the prior, prior lectures have already occurred listed here and they are recorded so that if you have not heard them, you can um, go to this website and get them there. Uh, we also like to remind you there is a national substance use warm line. It's cost-free, confidential. It's a clinician-to-clinician -clinician teleconsultation staffed by addiction medicine and HIV specialists, clinical pharmacists, and advanced practice nurses. Here you can see the number. I would put it in your cell phone if you could. And we just wanted to remind you these are some of the financial relationships of our content on the web board. These are financial relationships uh, within the last two years for myself and Dr. Leish and the Planning Reviewer Committee. We're very pleased to say that there is CME with this. IAS USA designates this live activity for 1.25 AMA Category 1 credits. Also, it's approved for ABM IM mock points, nursing, pharmacotherapy, and pharmacy contact hours. And you can see here we have generous support from uh, uh, many um, contributors. And just a few uh, points for this um, presentation. Poll questions are gonna pop up. And if you could please um, answer those in the poll. Uh, and then if you have questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Leish, please put your question in the Q&A um, uh, button, not the chat button. Um, and in the chat, you can just at, say hi or you know ask general questions if you want. We are gonna um, go to the questions though at the end of Dr. Leish's presentation. So I'm gonna be moderating that. So just feel free to pop them in there. And um, this is the poll results from our demographic questions. And now I'm pleased to present our uh, presenter of the day, Dr. Leish, take it away. Okay, everyone. Hi, hopefully you're all seeing my screen. Um, thank you, Dr. Springer, for that lovely handoff. Um, 
The, our learning objectives for today is that on completion of this activity, learners will be able to describe the three FDA um, approved medications for opioid use disorder and how they relate to HIV care, that you will be able to implement standard induction protocols for buprenorphine in patients with HIV and opioid use disorder, and apply alternate strategies for initiation of buprenorphine in patients with a history of or concern for precipitated withdrawal. Sorry, Dr. Do one... we, we, we see your uh, presenter view, not the uh, oh. full screen view. Sorry about that. Oh, no, thank you for, for telling me that. That's weird. The show, how about that? Better? Yes, perfect. Great. Um, I do have one poll, which you have already seen on the presenter view. <laughs> Um, just so I know who I'm speaking with today, what is your experience with patients with HIV and opioid use disorder? Um, do you not see many patients with co-occurring OUD or you see them, but you often have not managed the OUD yourself? You see them and you've begun to manage the OUD um, yourself or um, uh, you see them and you are confident in your ability to manage. All right, there we go. There's the results of that poll. Okay, so um, some not seeing and some um, seeing but not managing, a little, a little bit doing both. Great, good for me to know as we present. So we're gonna start this conversation um, as we start most conversations in medical education with a patient because that's what we're here for. Um, and this is the pretest question. Um, it's a 27 year old woman with HIV presents with a request for help with opioid use disorder. She has been off antiretroviral therapy for the past three months, but previously had plasma HIV RNA level suppression and no adverse events on lamivudine, zytovudine, efavirenz. And she would like to restart this regimen. She has tried quitting opioids several times, but efforts have been limited because of her inability to tolerate withdrawal symptoms. Her urine drug screen is positive for opiates and negative for fentanyl. Her last drug use was heroin the previous evening. The patient currently has stable housing but relies on friends for transportation. She has moderate withdrawal symptoms and feels very uncomfortable. Which medication for opioid use disorder is the most appropriate to offer this patient in the clinic today? And we'll go to question two. Oh, sorry, there's your answer. Most people wrote buprenorphine, a little methadone, a little naltrexone, okay. And question two here. Um, a 35-year-old woman with HIV and opioid use disorder is being admitted to the hospital for infectious complications of injection drug use. She will require intravenous antibiotics and will be in the hospital for two weeks. She has previously had a three-year period of sobriety while on extended release buprenorphine and would like to restart this treatment but has had repeated bouts of precipitated withdrawal when trying to initiate buprenorphine from fentanyl. She waits as long as she feels she can tolerate, but she still feels worse after taking two milligrams to four milligrams of buprenorphine. This had led, has led to repeat fentanyl use. Which of the following is an appropriate strategy for medications for opioid use disorder initiation in this patient? Looks like we have a variety of responses, but most people vote for beginning a full agonist and starting buprenorphine. Um, and we'll see um, what that looks like toward the end. I do um, wanna remind everyone that screening and diagnosis were covered in more detail in prior talks that are available online on demand at the IASUSA website. Um, and so please do see those because I'm not gonna talk about screening or diagnosis today. The one reminder I did want to give everyone, though, is that our words affect how we view and treat our patients. Um, so this was a study done um, where they looked at 728 mental health care providers attending two mental health addiction focused conferences and 516 people completed surveys. They randomized patients to a clinical scenario where they used the term substance abuser or one where they used the term substance use disorder. 
The vignettes were otherwise exactly the same. Um, and there was a survey gogging whether patient, whether the providers felt the patient presented in the vignette should receive more therapeutic or punitive action or pose a social threat or could regulate their behavior. And so the clinical vignettes look something like this. You can see one says Mary is a white woman who has completed college. She is a substance abuser who has managed to get through the challenges she has faced as a recovering addict, she lives with her family and enjoys spending time outdoors and taking part in various activities in her community. She also works at a local store. And then they took the same words and just replaced has a substance use disorder and wrote a woman in recovery. And what they found um, is that clinicians assigned to the substance abuse or vignette were more likely to agree with punitive actions, even though the person was in recovery, right? Um, and that the participants showed negative bias towards terms such as addict, alcoholic, medication-assisted treatment, and relapse. And there were positive association toward terms like long-term recovery, medications for OUD, um, medication-assisted recovery, and recurrence of use. And so we just encourage everyone to use language um, that promotes um, wellness of our patient and not stigma. So please avoid terms um, like these um, when you're posing your questions at the end and when, more importantly, when you're dealing with your patients um, and try and use terms that decrease stigma um, like person with substance use disorder, substance use disorder, urine drug screens are positive or negative, um, not clean or dirty, things like that. All right, the other um, clarification I will make is that we are speaking predominantly about opioids today, um, and that is for a couple reasons. One, opioids drive a large portion of overdoses. Um, they are not the only driver of overdoses. You can see that psychostimulants are second in the rank, um, but opioids are unique among these top seven drivers of overdose deaths in that opioids um, have FDA approved medications to treat opioid use disorder. Um, I know in some of the other talks, you guys talked about uh, medications for alcohol use disorder and nicotine use disorder, which is important. Um, and please see those other talks for those. Today, we're gonna focus on opioids because of the overdose death rates. You can see there are three FDA approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And it's important that we all learn about this. I'm passionate about teaching it, this to a variety of providers for two reasons. One is that these medications are highly effective at reducing mortality. You can see in this study from La Rochelle and his colleagues that all-cause mortality in the first year after a non-fatal opioid overdose was reduced um, by being on any of the three FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder. So that's these three lines down here. This is the reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, unfortunately, this study also showed that only about 15% of patients were actually prescribed a medication for opioid use disorder after their non-fatal opioid overdose. And this study examined data from 2012 to 2014. A slightly more recent study was done through the national um, uh, a survey of housed persons um, that showed only about one in five adults with opioid use disorder received medication uh, to treat it in 2021. And again, the study was done on uh, surveyed housed patients, and so the number is probably even lower um, in those who are unstably housed. So I just like to make sure that every provider who contacts a patient is aware of how to treat OUD, um, because you might be the only provider that those people are seeing um, at all, um, and definitely you might be the only one willing to provide this care. All right, so we're gonna talk about the three FDA approved medications. The first medication we'll talk about is methadone. Methadone was the first FDA approved medication for opioid use disorder. It is a mu uh, receptor, a full mu opioid receptor um, agonist, meaning that if you give uh, a higher dose of methadone, you get more activation of that receptor. You can see the methadone line goes up here, um, all the way to a point where you can get respiratory depression and, and death. Um, and so methadone cannot, it ha I'm sorry, methadone um, also has a modest affinity for the mu opioid receptor. And so it will replace and block some other opioids, but not those with higher affinity. And it has a long and variable half-life, meaning it stays around um, for a very long time. And so the person doesn't go in and out of withdrawal like they might if they were on a shorter acting opioid. Um, 
The other thing to know about methadone is that it has unique adverse effects. So because it is a full agonist, it can cause respiratory suppression. And so it cannot be prescribed um, through a clinic. It has to be dispensed from a federally registered opioid treatment program. You sometimes hear these called OTPs. They're commonly known as methadone clinics as well. And they're sites where patients go daily for directly observed therapy. Methadone can also cause significant QTC prolongation usually at doses greater than 100 milligrams or when in combination with other QT prolonging drugs. Therefore, it does typically require periodic ECG monitoring. In addition, methadone utilizes multiple CYP enzymes and therefore has a plethora of drug-drug interactions. One uh, of the one of particular interest to this group would be that nevirapine, efavirenz, and ritonavir, as well as lapanavir, ritonavir, and ritonavir, ritonavir combinations, may require higher methadone doses, and methadone may increase cytobutene levels. This is um, really all I'm going to say about methadone, um, as it is not one that you would regularly be prescribing from clinic. I did just wanted you, I did just want you to know about it in case your patient is on it and you have to worry about their antiretroviral therapy regimen or know how to check their QTC. If you thought a patient might benefit from being on it, but knowing you can't prescribe it in clinic, one of the ways that you can find them treatment is to go to the website findtreatment.gov. This is a website run by um, uh, SAMHSA, the uh, Society of Mental Health and Substance Use, and they will help you locate a treatment site close to the patient. It's actually a really great site where you can sort by insurance and the type of MOUD you want. The next um, medication we'll talk about is naltrexone. Naltrexone was the second FDA-approved medication for opioid use disorder. It comes in an oral and an IM version. However, the IM version, it's a once monthly version, is the recommended formulation for opioid use disorder. It is also approved for alcohol use disorder and you can use the oral version for that if you would like, but we no longer use the oral version for OUD. Now, Trexone is a full mu, mu opioid receptor antagonist. It will sit on the mu receptor and block it. You can see that even with higher doses, you don't get any activation of that mu pathway. It's all blocked. And it has a very high binding affinity and thus will displace pretty much all opioids from the mu receptor. And once on the naltrexone for a while, its blocking of the receptor will lead to much decreased tolerance. It's important to educate patients on that um, in case they they have a lapse to use after they stop naltrexone because the period right after stopping naltrexone is a time in which patients are particularly vulnerable to accidental overdose. Um, so that's one of the points of education we have for patients. It's also worth noting that naltrexone has very few drug-drug interactions. Um, and so there are no known drug-drug interactions for antiretroviral drugs. Um, patients, or a lot of people ask, um, since there are more than one medication for OUD, which one's the most effective? And in general, they're all considered about as effective um, as each other. And my mantra about naltrexone, though, is that it is very effective for OUD if you can get your patient on it. Um, the graphic uh, you see here is from the XBOT study, which was a large study comparing extended release naltrexone to extended release buprenorphine. And you can see from the flow chart that approximately equal numbers of participants were randomized to each arm, so 287, 283. However, if you look toward the bottom of that chart, you can see that a disproportionate number of the patients in the naltrexone arm failed induction. Um, in fact, this plays out in the graphs below it, where the left graph shows the intent to treat analysis, meaning that uh, they included every patient randomized to that arm. And you can see here that there is a clear difference between the medications um, with buprenorphine looking more superior if you look at everyone who is put on that arm in this graph. The right graph is a per protocol analysis, meaning they only looked at the people who got onto the medicine, and then they look like they're of similar efficacy. And so again, if you can get your patient on it, it will work just as well. Then the question becomes, why is it so hard to get our patients on naltrexone? Um, and so that is because, remember, it is a full mu opioid receptor blocker, and patients are up here with activation. And so in order to not make them violently ill when we give them the naltrexone, we have to diagnose them with opioid use disorder in the clinic, and then we start 
a ton of medicines to try and help control all their horrible symptoms of withdrawal. So we'll start clonidine for agitation, lopiramide for diarrhea, acetaminophen and NSAIDs for body pain, ondansetron and promethazine for nausea and vomiting, hydroxyzine for anxiety and insomnia. And then you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait seven or more days. Um, we typically wait at least seven and then start checking urine drug screens. Um, fentanyl, because of its lipophilicity, tends to hang around a lot longer. Um, patients might still have fentanyl in their system for 10, 14, 21 days after last use. And so you have to wait that whole time until the urine, until the drugs are out of the system. And then you can begin a once monthly injection of IM naltrexone. It's 300 milligrams, 380 milligrams once per month um, IM. And then you follow up with them every four to six weeks. So some special considerations. So this often requires an inpatient detoxification um, or other forced period of sobriety where they're in some contained environment where relapse isn't an option. Because again, if stopping opioids for seven to 21 days were easy, then the person wouldn't have opioid use disorder, right? Um, and so often we see this being most used after a period of residential care or um, incarceration. Uh, the most common times we see naltrexone being started. It can be helpful with co-occurring alcohol use disorder, which is good to know um, for those patients who have co-occurring disease. Um, contraindications, uh, you cannot use it in acute hepatitis or in severe decompensated liver disease. You can't use it in anyone who's currently on opioids, as we just discussed. Um, and it, you cannot use it in patients who have rec recurrent severe pain episodes, for instance, sickle cell, that would require um, opioids for pain care. Because once you give them this, opioids will not work for pain care. Um, I educate my patients that they'll have to get an anesthesiologist probably involved in their care if they were to have a car accident or something, because it usually involves um, really, really, really high doses of IV fentanyl um, and ketamine to get acute pain control in patients who are on this. All right. So the next medication we'll talk about is the meat of the talk today, which is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine was FDA approved as a medication for opioid use disorder in 2002. Um, it is a partial opioid agonist, which means that if you give a dose of buprenorphine, you get more activation of the mu receptor um, up to a certain point, and then it kind of plateaus. Um, and so it never quite fully activates the mute opioid receptor. It is good to know buprenorphine is active at other opioid receptors, and so it can provide significant analgesia, um, even though it only partially activates the mu receptor. Um, but it is this partial activity at the mu receptor that makes it more safe to provide in a clinic um, because it doesn't cause as much respiratory suppression. And that's that partial agonism that's mentioned there. Um, it has a high binding affinity, meaning it will kick other opioids off of the receptor, and it has a slow dissociation, meaning it sits there for a while. Um, and so with that high binding affinity, we have to be careful when we first initiate buprenorphine to not cause precipitated withdrawal. Um, and so what that is, is if someone is up here um, on a high level of activation, and then you give them buprenorphine, it will kick the other opioid off their receptor, and they will be on this lower bar, and they will feel ill. They will have diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. They won't like buprenorphine. They won't like you. Um, and it's really hard to get buy-in after that. <laughs> And so we try to avoid that by waiting until enough full agonist has worn off of the receptor that you can give buprenorphine and they feel better. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that for the rest of this talk. So patient, people always ask me, people who are learning to prescribe buprenorphine, how do you know if a patient is in enough withdrawal to take the buprenorphine without having precipitated withdrawal? Um, and my answer is my favorite answer for all patient care related items, which is ask the patient. And so I ask the question to patients, um, have you ever gotten sick taking buprenorphine too close to heroin or fentanyl? And they will generally respond with one of four responses, maybe not in these exact words, but the gestalt is the same. Um, one is, yes, I have done that. It was horrible. I will never do that again. I know how long I have to wait. Um, another is, no, I have not experienced that myself, but I saw it happen to a friend, and so I make sure I wait as long as I can, and I've never had a problem. I know how long I have to wait. Others will say, like, what are you talking about? No, I haven't heard about that. They have no idea what precipitate withdrawal is. Um, and others will say, yes, that happens to me every time. And so we're going to talk about these four categories one at a time. 
Well, we're going to take the first two in one because they're kind of the same. If someone knows how long they have to wait, if they've gotten themselves onto buprenorphine seven times, they don't need my help getting onto the buprenorphine. Um, and so I don't spend a lot of time talking to them about precipitated withdrawal. I do educate all of my patients on proper sublingual technique because what I've found is that a number of patients are not educated on this, even if they've been prescribed buprenorphine before. So for proper sublingual technique, there is no eating, drinking, or smoking depending upon the guideline you read, it kind of varies somewhere between 15 minutes and 20 minutes before and after taking the medication. I tell my patients generally 15. Um, so no eating, drinking, smoking, 15 minutes before or after taking the medication. And then you see our little mouth that says no swallowing. So what they wanna do is hold the saliva in their mouth the whole time the pill dissolves plus five minutes. For most patients, this is about a full 15 minutes. So a lot of patients will put that tablet under their tongue, but then swallow like you would with a sucker. So like as soon as a little bit of saliva builds up, they'll swallow. But there is 97% first pass metabolism of buprenorphine. So any buprenorphine they swallow, they don't get to use. Um, and so I just encourage patients to hold their saliva in their mouth the whole time it's dissolving. Sorry, I bumped my scroller. The whole time it's dissolving plus five minutes. And I educate everyone whether they've been on it or not. Um, and so for those first two categories of patients, that's all you have to say. Like, let me, is it okay if I tell you just a little bit about the proper way to take it under the tongue? And then I tell them those few things and I write them a script and send them out. If a patient answers, what are you talking about when I ask them about precipitated withdrawal? I then have to educate them on precipitated withdrawal or I have to help them um, through it. So if it's in the inpatient setting, I might do a, a clinical opioid withdrawal scale calculation um, using MD Calc. So clinical the COWS or clinical opioid withdrawal scale is a little bit like the CWA we use for alcohol in that the symptoms are intuitive, but the scoring is not. Um, and so I tell people to just go to MD Calc or your favorite medical calculator and use that. In general, for opioids other than fentanyl and methadone, we wait to a COWS of eight. For fentanyl and methadone, we wait for a COWS of at least 14. And that is just because the risk of precipitate withdrawal is higher with those. If a patient is doing an at-home induction rather than an in-hospital induction, I will explain the concept of precipitated withdrawal. And then if they are tech savvy, I will show them this buprenorphine home induction app. So that little teal stop sign looking thing is actually, it's a teal suboxone. That's the shape of the suboxone tablets. And so I will help them find that on their phone and they can download it. It is a free app and it walks them through a cows and tells them when they're in enough withdrawal to start their first buprenorphine dose. Um, and then they get to enter like their dose they took and their symptoms and it tells them what to do after that. It's really a handy little app. If your patient is not as tech savvy um, or your clinic isn't, that's fine. Um, if you Google image buprenorphine home induction, there's about 30 versions of this kind of patient handout where it basically walks them through and says, before taking the buprenorphine, you want to feel as bad as you can feel. Um, the worse you feel before you take it, the better you'll feel after. You should have at least three of these following feelings. Um, and then it kind of walks them through how to take it. There's lots of um, samples of that online. I'm not attached to a particular one. All right. And so in so for these patients, you then have to talk to them about standard induction, right? So you tell them about precipitate withdrawal, you give them their favorite handout on standard induction, and it's good for us um, to understand how standard induction works in order to explain it to our patients. And so the main premise of standard induction is to wait until the patient is having enough withdrawal symptoms and then give them a dose of buprenorphine that results in relief. Um, so you can imagine on this graph, if the pink box represents um, an area where the patient feels withdrawal symptoms, then you would want to wait until their full agonist is way down here, right? And then when you give them buprenorphine, it comes up here um, and they feel better. Um, so the how long to wait is based on the patient's symptoms. The second question I get most often is what is the first dose I should give them? Like what's the target first dose treatment? Um, and so we're gonna talk about that um, now. So the first day target dose um, depends on the medicine that or the drug they were using. So the first day target dose and typical maintenance dose will depend on the opioid being misused. Um, for opioids of misuse, 
I included this graph because there are some regional variations. If you don't know what Tiana, Zaza, and Kratom are, it means you are probably not located in the Southeast um, because this is where we have a lot of that. <laughs> Um, but for those of us who are located in the Southeast, I thought it's important for you to know. Um, so Tiana, Zaza, and Kratom are gas, well, um, opioid-like uh, herbal substances or pharmaceutical substances, which can be um, procured in your local gas station um, uh, in some of the Southeast states. And it is, uh, there are studies where they can treat this use disorder with buprenorphine. We tend to use much lower doses than we would use for traditional OUD. Um, and so the typical first day is one to four milligrams and a maintenance dose would be two to 12 with most patients being stable on four to eight for these substances. For the higher OME prescription medications, such as oxycotton, oxycodone, um, and heroin, so this is what all OUD treatment looked like, say, five years ago, the typical first day dose was 8 milligrams to 12 milligrams, and typical maintenance dose was 12 to 20. Now that fentanyl is around um, and fentanyl analogs, the typical first day dose is 12 to 16 milligrams, and the typical maintenance dose is 16 to 24 milligrams, with some patients needing even higher than that. Now, I will say I included in this graph this higher OME section just as much for historical knowledge and um, for some people who might be caring for patients who are having misuse of their own prescribed opioids. If your patient is misusing sourced opioids, meaning they got them from someone else, they more than likely contain fentanyl um, and they may require these higher doses. So just be aware of that. All right, and so that's how we manage standard induction. For my last set of patients where we ask, have you ever gotten sick taking buprenorphine too close to heroin or fentanyl? And they say, yes, it happens every time. I've tried so hard to get off and I can't. Um, then we have to take different approaches. Um, how many patients experience this? Well, that is presently up for hot debate. Um, you will see in this multi-site ED-initiated buprenorphine trial of 1,200 patients, the incidence was less than 1%. Um, in this study of 28 EDs participated um, between June 30th, 2020 and October 26th of 2022, patients were randomized to standard sublingual buprenorphine induction, that's the one we just talked about, or extended release buprenorphine, um, which is a version that you can get sub-Q, and were observed for two hours. Precipitated withdrawal was defined um, a priori and was considered when a marked escalation in objective cow scores uh, occurred. So a score greater that uh, was greater than five points greater than their prior score, um, or they required additional buprenorphine and ancillary medications. Um, and uh, of the 1,200 patients, only nine had precipitated withdrawal. And so it looked like from this study that the incidence of that is less than 1%. Um, that being said, talk about it is all over. And so regardless of the actual prevalence, talk and fear about precipitated withdrawal coming off of fentanyl is common among our patients. Um, so many of my patients are worried about this before they ever show up, before they've even tried buprenorphine. Um, and remember that fear of withdrawal is something that drives pathologic substance use. Um, and so um, talking with our patients about the actual prevalence of precipitated withdrawal can help decrease some of that. Um, you can see that uh, as fentanyl went up, precipitated withdrawal posts went up, um, and patients definitely associate fentanyl with an increased risk of CPA withdrawal, whether that's true or not. Um, the question becomes, why does fentanyl cause this problem of precipitated withdrawal in some patients? Like, why do patients get it? Um, that is the million dollar question at the moment. There are a lot of theories on this. Some of the more popular theories are that fentanyl is relative to other opioids, much more lipophilic um, and possibly stores in fat. Uh, and then another theory is that the illicit fentanyl contains um, contaminants with other fentanyl analogs, and maybe it's the other fentanyl analogs that are also causing this. Um, and then another theory is that maybe nitazines, which are sort of these novel drugs on the market that are opioid-like, um, are the ones that are causing the precipitated withdrawal. As of yet, none of us really know. Um, we just know that some patients really do experience this. Um, 
So if we can't answer the why, the question becomes, becomes what? What can we do to help those patients who have recurrent precipitated withdrawal? So um, there are several options for this, and we're going to talk about that. Um, of course, one option is to switch to a different medication for opioid use disorder, such as methadone, that does not cause precipitated withdrawal. But unfortunately, methadone is not an option for all patients due to factors such as lack of transportation, distance to nearest methadone clinic, and necessity of daily observed dosing or medical contraindications. So other alternatives, including admitting patients for detoxification, um, become an option. You would probably need that if you were considering naltrexone. Um, or if you wanted to admit them to, for medical detoxification to wait for enough fentanyl to come out of the system to be able to start the buprenorphine. I have had patients who have pre experienced precipitated withdrawal with three to seven days of sobriety from fentanyl, um, and that's with initiating buprenorphine. Um, and so for those few patients where it occurs, it becomes a very sticky thing to manage. Um, and what we do in those situations is we trial different techniques um, for initiating buprenorphine, the most common of which is something called microinduction. Um, and then there's another version called macroinduction, and we're going to talk about those now. Um, I do find as we begin to talk about the different methods to avoid precipitate withdrawal, I sometimes find it helpful to share a different graphic that explains it slightly um, differently than the two lines that I just showed you. You know, I showed you the activation line and coming down to the other line causes it. Um, there, another way to think about that is if all of your receptors are occupied um, by a substance like heroin or fentanyl, and then we give you a standard therapeutic dose of buprenorphine. So for someone on fentanyl, this would be like a first day dose of eight milligrams. Um, then you, all of that heroin and fentanyl gets replaced off of the receptors at the same time. And you have a rapid shunt um, in your activation. And about 20 minutes later, um, you feel pretty terrible. Um, you are this unhappy face with lots of withdrawal symptoms. Um, and so we use different induction techniques to try and avoid that. Um, and the two basic ways to prevent precipitate withdrawal is wait for withdrawal to happen naturally and then start the puke. That's the standard induction we already talked about. Or use a slower induction process, such as low-dose induction or the Azar method. And I'm going to explain both of those to you now. Before I start talking about low-dose induction, I want to tell you the general concepts behind it because it is really the general concept that you want to remember and not the specifics. Because if you look up 30 papers on microdosing, you will probably find 30 different regimens that you could use. Um, and that is because they're all just using these same basic concepts. Um, the basic concept is that you and slowly start low doses of partial agonists while continuing a full agonist and, uh, until the patient gets to a therapeutic dose of buprenorphine, and then you can stop the full agonist. The former names for this method were the Bernice method or microinduction, um, and there are versions A through Z. You can pick your version. Um, but I tell you these former names because patients will actually ask about it. If you go on Reddit, you can find Bernie's method um, talked about. Um, you can find Azar method talked about. Um, so patients know as much, if not more, about this than us sometimes. All right. So let's start by beginning talking about this low dose induction. Um, again, I'm going to show you multiple ways to do this. It's not so important that you remember every single way we do it as that you remember the concept. And the concept looks something like this. So on day one, they're going to have their opioid receptors occupied by heroin or fentanyl, and you are going to give them a tiny dose of buprenorphine, and it is going to replace just a little bit of that full agonist opioid, and they are going to continue to use a full agonist opioid, or if they're in the hospital, you will continue to order a full agonist opioid such that some of their receptors will have full agonists and some of them will have buprenorphine for two to three to honestly, if you look at some of the protocols, seven, 10, 14 days. So for some number of days, um, you will give them tiny doses of buprenorphine as you continue a full agonist until eventually by day X in this particular picture, it's day four, um, there is buprenorphine fully replacing the full agonist. Okay, so that's the general concept. And it's done so slowly over time 
that it is kind of like letting them slowly down from that upper line to the lower line, um, such that the symptoms aren't so bad or so present. One of the ways we do this is with something called the buprenorphine transdermal patch. I will note that this patch is not FDA approved for OUD, so we don't do this in the outpatient setting, but we do do it in the inpatient setting. The only time we do this in the outpatient setting is if we're starting buprenorphine for pain um, and risk mitigation on someone who's been on long-term full agonists. In fact, that's kind of how we learned how to do low-dose induction for people with um, opioid use disorder was through our pain patients, um, or patients with pain, sorry. Um, and so this is what we do in the hospital um, for some patients who are transitioning from uh, fentanyl to buprenorphine. On day one, we place one 20 microgram per hour patch um, while continuing some full agonist. It doesn't matter what full agonist you pick to prescribe while they're in the hospital because you're allowed to do that in the hospital to treat the pain uh, symptoms of withdrawal. Um, and so we normally will do slow release morphine. Um, sometimes it will be oxycodone if the patient is admitted like for a trauma related to substance use. Um, and they'll be on that full agonist and you place the patch while keeping the full agonist the same dose. And then day two, you add another patch, keep the full agonist. Day three, another patch, keep the full agonist. And then day four, you peel all of those patches off and start sublingual buprenorphine. And either by day four or somewhere by day 10, um, you will have reached a therapeutic dose of buprenorphine. Again, that therapeutic dose, depending upon what opioid they're coming from, for most people coming from fentanyl, we try to wait until they're on at least 12 to 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, and then we stop the full agonist. Um, and you can see there's just another protocol version. Again, there's thousands of ways to do this. The concept is the same. How slow you make the induction depends on the patient's personal history with precipitate withdrawal and um, how much anxiety they have about it, um, right? And how much withdrawal they can tolerate, right? So if this is a young, healthy 22-year-old with no medical problems, you might be willing to let them tolerate a little bit more than, say, um, a female in the third trimester of pregnancy or a, you know, 54-year-old who just had a massive MI. You might not want that person having um, any degree of withdrawal. And so then you might slow down this transition. The longer the transition is, the less likely they are to have precipitated withdrawal. Um, so in this second version of it, you see they place one patch on day one, and then instead of on day two placing another patch, they do that on day three. And then on day five, they place a third. And on day seven, they take them off and transition to buprenorphine. It's the same thing, just happening slower. Um, the full opioid agonist, again, remains at the same dose the whole time. Low-dose induction can also be accomplished with um, low-dose uh, low buprenorphine buckle formulation. Again, this is something that is FDA approved for pain and not for OUD, so we do this in the inpatient setting. Um, and this is just a sample of a ca uh, case study where a, more, a patient was maintained on a morphine PCA, and the buccal buprenorphine was increased from day one to day three to day four, and then on day six, the dose was titrated up to 16 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine, and they were able to stop that PCA. Again, more options. Low-dose induction can also be accomplished with the buprenorphine sublingual film um, or tablet. Um, and so in the outpatient setting, we can use the tablet because it's approved for OUD, and so we're not going to get in trouble doing it. So we can do it outpatient or inpatient. I will tell you, this, this is an example. Ooh, somehow that went away. Um, here's an example of um, uh, an inpatient version. Um, we sometimes have trouble getting pharmacy to quarter tablets for us inpatient. And so I mostly use the tablets outpatient and then use the patches or the um, buckle film inpatient. Um, but the idea is the same. You start with a low dose. So what I do in the outpatient setting is prescribe um, two milligram tablets and have them quarter it. That's how you get this 0 0.5 milligram. Um, and then they take a quarter tablet and then a quarter tablet twice a day. And then you just keep building up over several days. Um, trying to keep the full opioid agonist the same. So in the inpatient setting, this is really easy because we're prescribing it. Um, in the outpatient setting, what this means is that I have to tell my patient, you should expect to use, continue using um, the drug that you're using in a, basically the same quantity that you're using until we get you onto this buprenorphine all the way. In fact, it will go better until you do. I used to tell my patients, um, you might end up using um, but what I found is then they feel guilty if they do and they stop the buprenorphine um, and they run away from clinic. And so now I just tell them, like, I pretty much expect you to have to continue using for the next week. Um, and I hope by next week, maybe you'll be able to stop, but I'm not sure. Um, but this is how we're going to get you on to buprenorphine. 
Um, and so these are just two other examples. All right. This is a sample of the handout I give my patients in clinic. It doesn't mean it's the best one. It doesn't mean it's the only one. It's just one that we developed to help explain it to patients. As you can imagine, it's a little confusing when you're telling them to take a different dose basically every day. And so I would suggest if you're doing this in your clinic um, to go ahead and make something up um, and lay it out for them very, very clearly. Um, and again, this is uh, created from when we used to tell people, even if you did as though they might, now I just tell them, you, you will probably have to. All right, and so those are all the examples of low-dose buprenorphine induction. The one other um, method that I'll talk about um, for buprenorphine induction uh, that uh, is not macrodosing or high dose is something called the Azar method, which is a little bit of a, a not highly utilized method I don't anticipate that most of you would be doing this um, unless you're working in the hospital with vulnerable patients, um, but I want you to be aware of it in case you are. So the Azar method is something that involves using a fentanyl patch in order to bridge people onto buprenorphine. So when do we use this technique at our facility? We use this um, if and only if they are admitted to the hospital and that they need buprenorphine initiation from fentanyl who cannot or should not have withdrawal symptoms. So for instance, um, they are pregnant or they just had a polytrauma and you don't wanna stop all opioids um, just to get them onto buprenorphine and let them suffer through pain of their polytrauma. Um, or they just you know, had a severe uh, acute kidney injury and you don't want them to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea at the time they have kidney injury, something like that. Um, or in select patients who have failed standard inductions and low dose inductions and just are really having a hard time getting on. Um, you also want to make sure that the patient is not at risk of a fast or unanticipated discharge, such as a patient-directed discharge, um, and plan for an addiction consultation as soon as possible. So this is not something we like um, many of the general teams to do. We just like them to know about it in case they're having trouble getting a patient on buprenorphine. And then the question becomes, what is the starting patch dose if you're going to place a fentanyl patch on someone who's using fentanyl? Um, for low to moderate opioid tolerance, we use 12 to 25 micrograms. So that would be someone who's using, you know, maybe once a day, maybe a small quantity a day. For patients who are using a, a moderate to large quantity of fentanyl every day, we use a um, 550 microgram per hour fentanyl patch, and then we reassess their symptoms. And so the case that this was based off of was one where a patient was transitioning from methadone onto buprenorphine. And you can see um, that the patient was using methadone and then was admitted to the hospital for pneumonia. They placed the fentanyl patch on day two, and then they waited several half-lives of methadone, so multiple, multiple days, um, like seven um, days, until they started giving buprenorphine. And then they gave buprenorphine in incrementally higher doses as they continued the fentanyl patch. Now, I know some smart, savvy person out there is going to ask me, why doesn't the fentanyl patch cause precipitated withdrawal? And I will tell you that is a golden question that no one has been able to answer for me. Um, and I think would probably hold the key to helping us understand why illicit fentanyl causes precipitated withdrawal um, if we could um, investigate more into it. But I will tell you that we do this um, often for our pregnant patients and we have them on fentanyl patch for long enough for the illicit fentanyl to get out, so two to three days. And then we pull off the patch and immediately give them buprenorphine and they have no precipitate withdrawal and it's all fine. Um, so that being said, it is something that we utilize for specific populations, but not everyone. All right, and it should generally be done um, with addiction medicine consultation. All right, you saw that all of those take somewhere between three and seven, 10 or 14 days. So somewhere between three and 14 days. And some of you may be wondering, what if you just don't have that much time? Like the patient wants to leave tonight or they're, they're supposed to be discharged tomorrow. What are the other options? Um, so the other option would be something called macro dosing or high dose induction. High dose induction focuses on treating through rather than preventing withdrawal. Um, this is a sample of a study that looked into it where they um, confirmed the time since the last opioid dose and then they assess the cows, and when there was, um, if there was signs of withdrawal, then they gave them buprenorphine, four to eight milligrams, based on the severity of their withdrawal symptoms, and then they reassessed in 30 to 60 minutes, and if they had worsening withdrawal, um, they would consider high-dose induction, um, and high-dose induction would only be considered if there were no signs of sedation or respiratory depression, 
if the patient had high opioid tolerance and a cow is greater than eight on reassessment and uh, did not have high risk or did, sorry, did have high risk social factors. So they were worried about what's going to happen if this patient leaves not on buprenorphine. Like if they leave not on buprenorphine, are they just never going to be on it? And if the answer to that is yes, then they did um, high dose induction. And high dose induction involved giving eight milligrams to 24 milligrams per dose um, up to 32 milligrams. And so most of the, pro this is just one of the protocols um, that did it. It was one of the first ones. Um, but most since then were done in urgent cares or ED settings and involved giving 16 to 24 milligrams in one to two doses um, and also involved significant patient and provider buy-in. Um, so my mantra about high dose induction is that you should not do it unless you are prepared to see the patient through it. Um, so what is unfortunately not published in a lot of the studies, but knowing um, the authors and knowing my own experience with high dose inductions, you are treating through severe, short-lived but severe withdrawal. And so it is not uncommon to have to use benzodiazepines, sometimes even ketamine, um, lots and lots of promethazine, lots and lots of, you know, acetaminophen, gabapentin, um, to try and control the pain, uh, rigors and things like that for the one to six hours that the withdrawal might last while the buprenorphine is taking effect. So as long as you are prepared to help the patient through that, um, it, it does get people on a whole lot faster than the other methods. All right. So how do you choose? How do you choose between a low dose standard or high dose induction? Um, you can kind of think of it a little bit like this. The advantages of a high dose stabilization are that there, or a high dose induction is that there's quick stabilization and it, it will make sure they're on it by the time they leave. For standard induction, most patients are going to do okay, right? And so it's well described. Um, and for low dose, um, opioid absence is not required at first. And so there's, you can get on with low dose without any withdrawal, right? Like standard and high dose both require some withdrawal. Um, and so that leads to the next line, need for opioid withdrawal. Yes, yes, no, right? Like if someone can't tolerate any withdrawal, low dose is the way to go. Um, the initial starting dose varies by induction uh, technique. And the duration until stabilization varies, obviously with low dose taking much longer and high dose taking much shorter. Um, and uh, the use of full agonists varies. So low dose induction is the only one that uses full agonists. And so is one of the more difficult ones to do outpatient and one of the easier ones to do inpatient if your patient is staying long enough. And I hope that clarifies some of those different techniques for you. I just wanted to share a couple last thoughts. So the future of successful buprenorphine initiation hinges on a few things. Um, a major one being more experience and evidence. So understanding why certain patients get precipitated withdrawal when others do not. And then having head-to-head -head comparisons of induction techniques. So many of the techniques, they've all been in um, essentially studies looking at themselves and not looking at comparing low dose to high dose and things like that. Um, it also hinges on uh, aggressive precipitate withdrawal management and understanding what those adjuncts are to use. So again, a lot of these adjuncts aren't published in the studies. And so sometimes when things like high dose induction get implemented in the community, it's done without the adjuncts and it does not go as well as it did in the study um, because the patient who's lying there writhing in pain and sweating who doesn't get ketamine or diazepam is going to leave before they get their extra eight to 24 milligrams um, of buprenorphine. Um, and so just knowing more about precipitate withdrawal management is going to be important for all of us. It'll also be important that we have more consistency and integration of these. Like I just showed, um, we use different medicines for precipitate withdrawal uh, at different institutions. And so having more standardized opioid withdrawal assessments and uh, responses to those numbers will be important. Also guidance for standard starts. I just showed you there's different starting doses depending upon the opioid they're coming from um, and also depending upon the region. So in the Northeast, um, the quantity of fentanyl used and the potency of fentanyl sold um, is greater than in the Southeast. Um, so for instance, when we do the Azar technique, um, it's most of our patients are withdrawal fee free on 50 micrograms to 100 microgram fentanyl patch. 
I spoke with a friend in Vancouver in order to get patients withdrawal free from their fentanyl use up there. They're using 500 micrograms worth of fentanyl patches. And so they stopped using that technique because then it gets really uncomfortable prescribing. Um, but so finding those guidance for standard starts becomes hard just because of the difficulty in knowing what patients are actually using. But they would help us a ton if we could um, solidify some standards. Um, and also coordination across settings, like I just mentioned. Um, those are my thoughts on going forward with buprenorphine induction. So in summary, there are three FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder, methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine. MOUD is effective at reducing mortality and illicit drug use. Most patients, even those using fentanyl, will tolerate a standard induction with buprenorphine. Few, um, and for the few patients who need it, one could consider a variety of buprenorphine low-dose or high-dose approaches. Um, and so we will go with post-test question one, I won't read it this time. Um, so a lot of people saying buprenorphine. Yeah. So buprenorphine is the correct answer, although any of the above um, could theoretically be an option um, for an MOUD in general. Buprenorphine would be the most appropriate choice in this particular setting. Methadone is less favorable in this patient as she does not have reliable transportation, which would make getting to and from the opioid treatment program um, on a daily basis difficult, if not impossible. In addition, methadone increases the zytobutene levels and thus may increase the risk of adverse effects with patients' preferred HIV treatment regimen. Now, Trexone would not be, it, it is an option for MOUD, but it is not an option for starting clinic today. <laughs> and that was what the question asked, what can we start today? Um, as uh, the patient reports drug use within the prior 48 hours, and she must be at least be opioid free for at least seven days before naltrexone initiation to avoid precipitated withdrawal. Um, naloxone is an opioid overdose reversal drug, not a medication for opioid use disorder. So post-test question number two. All right. Um, so most uh, everyone was agreeing with continue the full agonists, right? Um, so uh, protocols for low-dose buprenorphine initiation generally include a full agonist opioid being given at a steady dosage for several days while buprenorphine is slowly increased to therapeutic levels. In the inpatient setting, this is done by replacing the street drug with an ordered full agonist opioid, such as slow-release morphine and oxycodone. Um, and the, the concept behind that, some people always wonder, like, why wouldn't you didn't decrease it? And the, the thought um, is that because the percentage of receptors that are available for binding is decreasing, you are if the actual um, um, activity of that agonist is decreasing over time um, because it can't bind to as many receptors. So keeping the dose the same offers more um, medication out there to compete with the buprenorphine for the available receptors. That's why we keep it the same. That's the rationale. Okay. Acknowledgements and disclosures. So I did have some graphics assistance from my colleague, Dr. Davis Bradford. He's just better at these things than I am. Um, and the information presented does not necessarily reflect the thoughts from my institutions, which are the Birmingham VA and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. All right. And I will stop sharing and hand back over for the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Leish. That was awesome. And I have, I mean, really a fantastic talk. And I don't just mean that because I really like talking about opioid use disorder. Um, so really, really great. But we do have quite a few questions um, that are, you know, very good questions. So, uh, and, and really practical questions. Um, a couple of you have answered in your talk. Uh, the the br brief one, uh, just, just if you could answer quickly is why would a patient 
uh, use oral naltrexone over IV, I think they mean IM naltrexone, um, isn't IM naltrexone better for adherence? And I think you did report how oral naltrexone is not really effective for opioid use disorder, but I don't know if there's any brief comment you wanted to make about that. But I think- Yeah, no, I only mention it because if you look at some of the older guidelines, it will mention oral naltrexone, but that was because that was all we had at that time. Um, really, since we've had IM naltrexone, it really is um, considered the only effective one for OUD. Oral naltrexone is effective for AUD, but not for, al so alcohol use disorder, but not OUD. Correct, and, and I think, um, yeah, so uh, just to point that out there, uh, some people um, do use oral naltrexone as this kind of test before they give IM naltrexone. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I I, I uh, dissuade people from doing that. But um, So me just... too, it's so funny. My, some of my colleagues do that all the time and I understand the rationale. So some people will, um, so say a patient is opioid abstinent, their UDS is negative, they will give them oral naltrexone just to see that the patient tolerates it before committing to them having it in their system for four weeks. The trouble with that is that oral naltrexone is associated with nausea while the IM version is not. Um, and nausea is one of those symptoms that we have a really strong memory for. Um, and so even if I tell a patient, hey, the IM version doesn't generally cause nausea, if they had it with the oral one, they get so anxious about getting it with the IM one that sometimes they change their mind. And so yeah. I do not do that. If I have any concern that the patient's at risk of precipitated withdrawal or the patient is worried, like, what if I get sick? What if I get sick? We will do what's called the naloxone challenge um, and we will give them um, naloxone. So like nasal um, naloxone in clinic and observe them for like 30 minutes to an hour. And if they didn't have any withdrawal with that, they're not going to have it with the naltrexone. Great. That's a, 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 yeah, I make that point too. And I think that's really important for people to know. All the other questions though, are really related to buprenorphine treatment. Um, I just want to quickly uh, get an answer to this one. It is an important one. Uh, someone asked, is there a greater risk of overdose, say from fentanyl during that low dose transition period? So as you're doing your transitions, um, is it possible, especially if you're providing this uh, at home, uh, of, of an individual overdosing. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah. So there's interesting research being done on using buprenorphine to reverse overdoses, um, right? Because it, even though it is an opioid and you're theoretically adding an opioid to opioids, it outcompetes the fentanyl. So whatever receptor the buprenorphine is binding to, it just stripped fentanyl off of. Um, and so it is, it does not increase the risk of overdose during that time. In fact, if anything, it might decrease it. Um, it's, you know, not therapeutic until you get therapeutic, but um, it does not increase the risk during that time. Right, and you probably recommend uh, in, in uh, naloxone and OE and opioid overdose education as well. Yes. For everybody. Yeah, so. I'm sorry, I should have said that while I was talking, but we give everyone who walks in our door naloxone. And so it's just so ubiquitous, I forgot to even mention it. But yes, everyone should get naloxone, even if they don't have OUD. So your patients with cocaine use disorder, your patients with methamphetamine use disorder, because fentanyl is showing up in everything. Um, we right. also give people um, a card for the Never Use Alone uh, hotline. I don't know if you've heard about Never Use Alone. No, um, uh, we, we actually should put that in here. And you're, yeah, if you give us the number, we'll add that. Yeah, you can say it. Line, grab it from my desk, but I'll put it on my slide set that goes on the website. How about that? Okay, great. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, we have a question about standard induction. A question mm -hmm. that says, how fast do you go from the first dose to the maintenance dose and do you titrate up? Is it daily or twice a day? And I, I think you might've, uh, I, I think you did touch on this, but someone really thinking about, is there anything you wanna add to other than what you've stated? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the first day dose, um, the first day is kind of dose finding um, and they will start um, with, usually four to eight milligrams and kind of keep taking those. We normally do like four milligrams and then four milligrams and then four milligrams um, every two hours until they have significant relief of symptoms up to 16 milligrams on the first day. Um, and then we prescribe enough for them to take 16 milligrams for the first three to five days and see them back in clinic. If they're still having withdrawal or craving, um, then we will prescribe four more milligrams. So a total of 20 milligrams. And then we'll see them back in another three to five days um, until we get there. So by the Physician drug reference, um, buprenorphine takes about 72 hours to reach um, steady state um, sublingually. And so we tend to go up every two to three days. 
Now that being said, if someone was previously on 20 or 24 milligrams and then had a lapse to use that was three months long, I don't start at 16 and take two weeks to get to 24. <laughs> um, I just get them back to 24 as quickly as possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have a, a couple of questions from uh, Dr. Eaton, um, and uh, I just want to get to those too. She uh, asked if, um, if uh, is it better to use buprenorphine product alone or buprenorphine combo naloxone is okay for microinduction? Buprenorphine, so, and I'm sorry, I normally give this disclaimer at every talk. I am too lazy to say buprenorphine naloxone every single time I say buprenorphine. But if I meant buprenorphine monoproduct, I would specifically say buprenorphine monoproduct. Um, and so in everything that I talked about today, it is perfectly fine to use the buprenorphine naloxone combination. Um, and in fact, that's what we standardly use. The only people we use buprenorphine monoproduct for are people with severe decompensated liver disease or patients who are pregnant. Um, and we now kind of know that it's probably safe to use the combo product even in pregnancy. It's just not considered standard of care at the moment. Okay, thank you. And if the patient does develop some withdrawal symptoms after the first eight milligram buprenorphine dose, um, they the the question is they've heard some patients say they just go ahead and take another one to two tablets. Is that advisable? Could they override the withdrawal with additional buprenorphine in the induction period? Mm -hmm. So I generally tell patients um, if you get if you take this dose and you get sick you have um, two choices. Option number one would be to just take more buprenorphine and just keep taking more until you feel better. Um, option number two would be to call clinic. And then we will talk about a different way for you to get on this. And really whether you choose option one or choose option two is up to you. The other thing I should have mentioned is that for everyone that I'm sending home um, with standard induction instructions who does not know how to get themselves on buprenorphine. So it's, it's not someone who says like, doc, I've, I've had precipitate withdrawal before. Um, I know how long I have to wait. I get on it without a problem. If they, if they fall into the category of people who are more like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never tried this. Then I will send them home with standard induction instructions and um, adjuncts for withdrawal symptoms should they develop. <laughs> um, and- or you don't use clonidine. Do you use Adorax or other things? I uh, use clonidine. I use okay. I use some um, clonidine. I use hydroxyzine. I use loperamide. Um, for mm -hmm. the rare patient, depending upon the situation, I might use a little gabapentin. It really depends. What I do is I ask them what symptom about what, what symptom of withdrawal bothers you most. And because some, you, it's, it is adjuncts. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Some people get horrible nausea vomiting. Others get none. Um, and I don't want to waste their money or mine giving them antiemetics if they don't get any. Um, but then I give them instructions like, if you do get sick, here's some medicines to take. If you can take those and take more buprenorphine, do that. Um, mm -hmm. If you're too scared or you feel too sick, call us and we'll talk to you about the other ways. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, really discussing, asking the patient um, and, and the patient's perspective and their, and their history is so important. So I'm really glad you, you, you just, dis you discuss that and, and are really bringing that home. Um, there are questions about how how do you actually recommend transitioning from methadone to buprenorphine? And I think you were alluding to it in your, you know, when you say that full opioid agonist um, in your um, your presentation, that 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 those types of slides and uh, could be helpful in that transition. Yeah. So if we were transitioning, like if someone's at an opioid treatment program and they would like to be on buprenorphine instead of methadone, we will call the opioid treatment program. We will tell them the patient's plan um, and we will tell them, hey, we need to keep your we need you to keep their dose steady, even though they're going to show up positive for buprenorphine because they're we'll let you know once they reach a therapeutic dose. And then we start very low dose and we titrate up. How fast we titrate up um, sort of depends on the patient's uh, degree of concern about withdrawal um, and the patient's methadone dose. There used to be some thought that you had to decrease methadone doses um, down to like 30 or 40 before you could do a low dose induction, but we now know that that's not true. Um, we have done low dose inductions on patients up to, I want to say 220 milligrams of methadone, um, which makes 
I have no reason to believe you couldn't do it higher. Um, the concept is still the same, but you just have to talk, work with the opioid treatment program. Um, we do normally take about two weeks to transition people from methadone to bupe with that low dose thing. And they just stay on both medications. And I know it feels anxiety provoking for some people to have someone on 150 milligrams of methadone and you know, seven, eight, the nine milligrams of buprenorphine. And you're like, oh, are they getting sedated? Are they getting sedated? But just remember like any receptor the bupe binds to, the methadone can't. Um, and so it just sort of goes into that. Um, that's that it's, it's not um, more dangerous than, than what they were doing before. Right. And we've, we've been doing this in the hospital as well and patients with infective endocarditis and other comorbidities. And you just keep the opioid as well as other additional opioids going and you can safely go up and um, and also we've been able to safely get them onto injectable buprenorphine, but you don't drop the methadone. And so, like you said, there's lots of things that have been published about this. Um, so um, I think, you know, there's, there's good information out there. And I think you answered the next question because uh, they're about the benefit of transitioning patients that have been on years potentially of methadone, which we see all the time, uh, onto a buprenorphine product. And I think you've already commented on how that's done. Like it, it, you just said that it can take a little while. It could take, uh, you know, and it's all really talking to the patient. And um, that again is like communicating with the methadone program, right? And also uh, making sure the patient understands and yeah. when we're doing it, right? Inpatient versus outpatient. Yeah. And so if you're, if you're talking about, I mean, did you say the benefits, like what would be the benefit of converting someone? Um, yeah. I think the question was what, yeah, why would you, what's the point of transitioning someone, I guess, besides the patient requesting to be on to buprenorphine, what would be the benefit of transitioning someone who's been on a stable dose of buprenorphine for years, or excuse me, methadone for years to, on to buprenorphine? Yeah. So I don't, I don't, mm. Rarely would I force someone to make that transition, right? right. Um, in yeah. fact, for OUD, I would never force someone to make that transition. For pain, I sometimes um, will force the transition. And the reasons we would begin talking to a patient about it, so say for OUD, if they're on methadone, say they have co-occurring COPD um, or um, bronchiectasis, and they're having recurrent hospitalizations related to pulmonary complications, you can somewhat improve their pulmonary status um, by changing from methadone to buprenorphine because it has less effect on respiratory drive. Um, and so that's, it's really more just a um, side effect profile thing if we ever do make that suggestion. Or sometimes cost, quite frankly, methadone, regardless of how stable you are, is, is often the same cost every day, whether you're going, you know, you pay for the day, whether you're going once a week or once a month, you still pay the same amount. Um, whereas with buprenorphine, once you space out to monthly visits, it's actually way cheaper to see the doctor and um, get a prescription for buprenorphine than it is to go to methadone clinic. I would say that yeah. by and large is the reason that most people want to transition. Right. And there might be some side effects like prolonged QT uh, and all sure. other things that make, make it happen. Um, there is a question about how you switch from sublingual buprenorphine to the film. Um, it, pretty much they're the same, it's the same dose, but I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that. So the sublingual tablet and the sublingual film are, are of most buprenorphine naloxone formulations are the same. There is one rogue agent out there called Zubsolve, and I will use its trade name because generically it's also called buprenorphine naloxone, which is very confusing. Um, but it's dose, you'll know if you see it because its doses are weird, like 5.7-2.0. dash it's, it's decimals and it's strange and it does not convert at quite the same um, ratio. Um, I do have that little graphic if you want me to show you, or, or I can put it in the slide set. The only thing to know about that one is that the 5.7 Zubsolve dose is equivalent to the 8 milligram um, Suboxone or standard buprenorphine naloxone formulation, but otherwise all the sublingual um, versions are the same. Um, right. The buccal formulations and the transdermal formulations are different. They are lower dose. And so most of those formulations are four milligrams or lower or equivalent to four milligrams or lower of the sublingual version and therefore are not approved for OUD um, because you wouldn't be getting a dose high enough. Um, one and two, they're not co-formulated with naloxone. 
Right. And I, um, uh, for the interest of time, what we'll do, there's another question that was asked off offline about how to, to what you had just described, convert from different formulations. And as you said, we'll put that in the slide deck for everyone to review. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, good questions that we should probably get to that um, are important. Um, you know, uh, what happens if somebody continues to use while they're on uh, treatment for Suboxone? Mm -hmm. I guess the question would be, what are they continuing to use? Um, mm -hmm. If they are continuing to use opioids, then I'm worried that my buprenorphine dosing is insufficient, right? Um, and we would work on adjusting um, their buprenorphine dose. Um, if we reach some ceiling dose, like 32, 36 milligrams, and we begin to want, and they're still using opioids, then we begin to get into questions of, um, are they taking it properly sublingual? Like, do, did they understand the instructions? Because sometimes we give the patients the instructions, but it's their first day in clinic and they're in withdrawal and they honestly can't hear everything we're telling them. <laughs> um, right. And they've signed 72 papers for consents and you know, medication contracts and whatever. Um, and so we just address those factors if it's opioids. Um, if it's things like methamphetamines or cocaine, I'm just honestly not super surprised because um, buprenorphine is FDA approved for OUD and not for other substance use disorders. Um, and so while I do hope that over time, um, the other substance use will disappear, um, we don't stop the buprenorphine because of it because I'm not expecting the buprenorphine to affect it. We do sometimes monitor patients more closely. Um, in general, we'll follow people weekly while they're positive for other substances if that isn't a barrier to care. If someone has to drive 25 miles to my clinic and me making them come every week is going to make them stop, then I don't do that. <laughs> right. Um, but if they can come to clinic weekly, I will um, just as for an opportunity to engage in motivational interviewing um, and to make sure they are up to like have an active um, Narcan kit at home because they do remain at risk of fentanyl overdose, even if they're using methamphetamines or cocaine, right? Um, to offer them fentanyl test strips, to offer them other harm reduction counseling and things like that. Right. And we only have time for a couple more questions, but I know we're ending at 345. So if you want to stay, um, if it, uh, we, we got the uh, go ahead to, to stay and answer a couple more. But, um, you know, there's question, there, a question about, um, is it possible to get patients off all opioid use disorder therapies if patients ask for methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone are lifelong, lifelong medications? How would you answer? So the way and, I tend to, and the follow up one is, are there any concerns about abuse of buprenorphine? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, how do I answer? My patient actually just asked me this today. Um, uh, my general answer is that there's really good data to say staying on it for at least the first year will reduce ER visits and uh, relapse rates. And so I encourage patients to stay on it for at least one year. There's emerging studies that show that patients who stay on it for the first five years um, probably have lower relapse rates. And so to consider being on it for longer than a year, maybe five years, um, and that some patients stay on it forever, um, and quite frankly, that's okay. Um, so I tend to think of buprenorphine a little bit like an SSRI. Um, if I started an SSRI for an acute depression after someone's loved one died, and six months later, they're like, you know what? I think I'm adjusted. I'm okay. I might taper that. Um, but if they, I started SSRI for severe or sorry, major depressive disorder with multiple suicide attempts, I'm not going to one year in say, Hey, do you think it's time to taper? Maybe we should go. <laughs> on this medicine. Um, so for someone who's had multiple overdoses and, um, a long-standing history of heroin or fentanyl use, if they stay on their once daily buprenorphine for the rest of their life, I really don't consider it um, a harm. I consider it a win um, yeah. because they otherwise are living a normal, healthy life, just like the patient on an SSRI or level thyroxine or, you know, name your other medication. Right. And I think that's important to point out that this is a, a you know, FDA approved, very effective treatments for a, a very serious life-threatening disease. And so there's really, and there's no data to support the long time, long term treatment is increased toxicity. So it's as long as they need it is is the key. Yeah. Um, there's one last question about um, headache as a, as a side effect of buprenorphine. Um, how would you uh, advise somebody if they don't want to take buprenorphine because of a headache? Mm. So most of our patients with with really adequate hydration. Um, and then intermittent Tylenol um, tolerate buprenorphine. I, I do see some patients um, who get 
symptoms with buprenorphine naloxone that don't get them with buprenorphine monoproduct. Mm -hmm. I know theoretically it is not absorbed at all sublingually. Um, in fact, it's not supposed to be um, absorbed. Uh, the naloxone is not supposed to be absorbed sublingually. Sorry. Um, it's there only to prevent injection. Um, and so I try to use the combo product. Like I just said, if someone's having severe headaches and they don't have access to another MOUD, so for instance, they live 30 miles from the nearest methadone clinic. If it's the difference of them being on MOUD on buprenorphine monoproduct or not getting treatment, I just switch to the monoproduct. Like it's, it, it'll be okay. And I do see less headaches with that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we haven't been able to answer all the online questions, but I think we got most of them. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Leish. Um, we are going to just uh, end with a few reminders, um, just uh, if there's evaluations, um, if you're still with us, information on how to claim the CME um, will be uh, emailed to you by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And, please, and we hope you give us our feedback. We have another awesome uh, series coming up, part four of this series, which is on alcohol and tobacco use disorders in patients with HIV by Dr. Geetanjali Chander. And that'll be November 30th, moderated by Dr. Ellen Eaton. And uh, just to remind you, IAS USA, uh, other um, series coming up, implementation of long-acting drugs for treatment and prevention of HIV, Monday, November 13th. You can see the times and also presentation by uh, cardiovascular disease prevention in patients with HIV, the reprieve trial, and some other upcoming awesome webinars by awesome speakers. Um, and uh, other meeting coming up, and we really wanna thank you for joining us and participating today. We appreciate it.